And there we go. We are the tribe from the north. We're brave and we're bold. Defeating our rivals never gets old. Making our way to the big sky conference. Watch out, cause here comes the silver and gold. Whoa, whoa. This is Tubbs at the Club for the Vandals of Idaho. Welcome back, Tribe from the North, Brave and Bold, to the official, unofficial podcast of your Idaho Vandals and the Vandal Affiliate on the Big Sky Podcast Network. I am your host of this crowded podcast today, Chris Hammond, and with me today we have Brian Marceau, the professor. How are you, Brian? Doing well, man. Doing well. Always good to hear it. And the best of all time, Alex, the boat boatman. How are you, Alex? Fantastic. Fantastic. Good. And running the show from the shadows, producer Dallas. How are you, Dallas? I am fantastic. Looking forward to this episode and Idaho football right mm. on the horizon. Yeah. For those of you guys joining us live on YouTube, you can see that we have athletic director Terry Golick with us today. Terry, most importantly, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Snowy day in Moscow. Actually, uh, you know, campus shut down, but I had planned to be home today working on some projects here uh, for the department. So glad to be here with you guys. Yeah, yeah. we're 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 super glad uh, you could join us. I know this is something a lot of our listeners are really excited for. So we appreciate that. Uh, we're gonna have Terry on for everybody for about 20 minutes, uh, and then we're gonna have her keep running the athletic program while we guys while we give you guys your 2020 spring football season breakdown. Uh, but before we get into it, we want to thank our sponsor, Montucky Cold Snacks. Ain't nothing like cracking a Montucky Cold Snack, an ultra refreshing light beer born in majestic big sky country. Best part is when you crack a snack, you're giving back. Montucky Cold Snacks donates 8% of all profits back to local causes, even right here in Idaho. Supporting organizations like the CW Hogs and the Idaho Food Bank. Yeehaw, that's freaking awesome. Montucky Cold Snacks, the light American <laughs> lager for pow pow rippers, gator wranglers, pony riders, and badass do gooders. Visit MontuckyColdSnacks.com today to find out how to get your ass some snacks. So <laughs> that is that is our magical ad read from uh, a nice Vandal alum there, uh, Chad from Montucky Cold Snacks. Um, all right, it is time. We, we've got Terry on the show, so we're going to do our best to get through all our questions that we can. And I know Brian has been working hard all basketball season, and he wants to start it off with basketball before we deep dive into football. And this will be real quick, listeners. Uh, focus is definitely the start of the season, but since we're covering basketball and we have the, the one and only on, time to ask. So, Terry, first question for you. Um, we all know Zach Kloss is in his, in his second year coaching Idaho. And a lot of our listeners are curious. I'm curious as well. What are the points of evaluation you use for coaches? And specifically, how has that class done in meeting those expectations thus far? Okay, good question, Brian. I'll start with, um, obviously, everyone's aware that he was in an interim position last year up until February. And that's when I gave him the nod as to be the head coach. So let's start with that. Difficult to recruit because... I had a young man, he actually decided to come and play for Idaho, but you never know who the coach is going to be when there's an interim. So, so that's tough. And as most people probably imagine um, when there's a, there's a change like there was at Idaho. And in particular, when I'll, I'll put it this way, there was an APR downward trend that was really significant that we had to stop. And that's one of the things that Zach is Adam about correcting. Uh, we actually had two back-to-back -back semesters of a 3.0 GPA. And in fact, this past fall, we had the highest ever men's basketball GPA since 2002, I believe, when they started tracking it. But to answer your question more specifically, uh, I always have looked at a couple of things always in terms of evaluating coaches and First and foremost is academics. We have athletes that are students first, so that's really important to not only me, but our coaches, all our staff, and the president and the institution. And knock on wood, we have, for the most part, great academic um, accomplishments going on. Even, even during the time of COVID when students weren't in class, 
Uh, secondly, it's always about student athlete experience. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, some of the coaches are really into developing young men or young women and life. You know, what are they going to be after life? So they like to teach a lot of lessons learned and culture and, and accountability. And that's been difficult for Zach as well. Um, there basically was not that level that we expect of that. So we've been developing that. And then, of course, and I know what everybody is worried about is competitive success. Yes, of course, we want to win. Nobody wants to win more than the coach and the athletes and me and you guys as fans. So uh, certainly recruiting will be a big part of that and turning that around. So we like what he's doing behind the scenes. It's been very difficult, but he continues to make progress, even though it's not in the win column. And to, to kind of piggyback off that, Terry, um, a lot of what you talked about is kind of behind the scenes stuff that uh, just the average fan wouldn't know, which is part of why we asked. Are there any sure. other issues that, that you didn't touch on yet that you feel like Klaus has fixed? And also, can you spend a minute commenting on uh, what is the, the issue that most fans interact with with the team, which is their win-loss record or their performance on the court thus far? I would say number one is his integrity. Um, before I even made the decision last year, I checked with his counterpart coaches in the department and to a T, one of, none of them said, you shouldn't do it. They actually encouraged me to make that decision, which just solidified the decision. So his integrity is at a high, high level, which is what we need. Um, he's a big people person and I don't want to say rule follower. That's a bit, that's not a great way to put it, but he expect, he expects things in the locker room out of, out of young men. And if they don't, if they're not following that, then he will make them sit the bench, which um, has happened on a few occasions recently. And I won't go into details on that, but you know, you don't know what goes on in the locker room and uh, you don't know what goes on in practices. And so you just have to put somebody in that position and watch what they do and trust that they're moving things forward. Let's uh I think it's time to start previewing the very promising looking football season. Alex, why don't you take it away with our our transition yeah. to the gridiron? Yeah, awesome. Can't wait. Vandal football next Saturday in the Kibbe Dome. Am I right? Next Saturday, am I, am I going crazy already? Yeah. Holy crap. Can't wait. I'll be there anyway. <laughs> um, Terry, so kind of want to talk ask you. So why is the spring season right for Idaho? We've seen schools in our conference opt out. We've seen the FBS decide that spring wasn't right for them as a whole and go straight to and play fall. Why was it right for Idaho and the Vandals? Well, great question, Alex. I'm so excited to be able to not only have football in the Kibbe Dome, and thank God we have a dome given the weather, but also have fans. Um, you know, it wasn't I can see why FBS made the decisions they did, quite frankly. They're tied to all the bowl games. Uh, we actually, obviously, in FCS, we're tied to the NCAA in the championship. I had told, oh, I don't know, in August or maybe September, we've been having so many meetings with our athletic directors in the big sky that we've discussed so many things from June on. That, And I said, you know what? If anything can move, it's FCS football because you could just move it to the championship to spring and then you're not up against the FBS. So I'm really excited about that. I think it's going to be an opportunity for our league to shine. It's unfortunate that some schools pulled out, but you know, that's them. That's not us. And why is it right for Idaho? We have been working since the day. I'm not kidding you guys. The day that we had to leave Boise from the women's tournament in my mind, I have been working through what can we do to, have athletes practice and play. And my head trainer and I, Chris Walsh, made the decision in April, let's do this. And if we're going to do it, let's do it the right way. That means testing. That means doing all the protocols we've been doing. And it's worked out great for us. And unbeknownst to me at the time, our president had the same kind of plan for campus. I don't know if you guys know this, but we've had in-person student classes and everybody's been tested multiple times for COVID. So it's it's really been phenomenal what our institution has done. And I heard uh, New York Times is going to be coming to campus and doing a story about it. Awesome. Yeah, I know. We we had Scott Green on for our holiday special, and we made sure he told everybody about that because you hear about it, but, you know, sometimes it doesn't get around the circles. But um, so I kind of want to bring it up. You've talked about how the university's done. 
a really good job of at the best of their ability containing and dealing with um, COVID-19 as it as occurs. And it's recently come out that the University of Idaho is expecting fans to be in the stands, um, currently selling tickets at priority and general admission next week. Um, can you kind of talk about what went into that? And then I've seen a reported number by Hero Sports of 6,400. Is that for sure what the number is or just what went into it and kind of where are we at with spectators come three home games this, this spring? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly a lot of planning with a lot of folks, whether it be um, our, it used to be called event services, but now it's uh, admin ops on campus. Our local uh, CDC health, they had to approve it. Of course, the governor had to, you know, remove the stage two and go to stage three. So just a lot of, a lot of things went into it. And we, we've been working through so many different plans and scenarios, but this one kind of came pretty quick. I didn't realize the governor was going to uh, flip it up to three as he did. And of course, our local health authority is willing to let us get in there. And it's not 6,400. It's only going to be 3,100. Mm. But in order to make it happen, we have to reseat the whole venue. There has to be reserve seating. So we're going to sell it in seats of four, so to speak. And if people want to have a different number, they have to call our ticket office eventually. Not now. We're getting hammered right now because people <laughs> people need to realize it's going to go to the to the you know folks that bought the season tickets and we're rolling everything that was bought from the fall over to um, next year. So it, it's been a lot of work, but it's been fun. And I cannot explain to you how much energy and enthusiasm it has been uh, at football practice. I have to make myself stay in my office because I love to go just in there, sit in there and watch the guys. And I even like to go down where they're getting taped up and chat with them. And there's, there's a lot of energy. Yeah. You're, you're talking to whole podcast season ticket holders. So we feel you there. I just found out I'm, I can't buy until Thursday. I was one of the ones busying up the ticket office today. I was like, I uh -oh. thought I could buy it. They're like, Oh, you're not quite, you know, in that order in, in line, but excited well at least you took your phone call chris i mean exactly you know. like it like you know. second second ring too it was i was like oh, oh yeah this athletic department is churning <laughs> yeah. it's fun you know and terry one of the things that was a story kind of in uh big sky media prior to really these last couple of weeks um, is some schools that are going to be playing spring have budget situations that make it a surprise that football is feasible without the FBS guarantee games. What has Idaho done that's, um, that's made it feasible for the university to take part in spring season in spite of the, I'm just going to presume COVID's not budget friendly. So what has <laughs> Idaho been able to do to be able to take part in the spring without guarantee games, even though, Hosting games is probably hosting the season itself is probably going to be a bit more expensive, I'm guessing, than typically. Well, it's interesting because we've run a lot of numbers, and you can imagine everybody's in a in a crunch in the budget. So one of the things we did right away when we were alerted to COVID and forward thought what might happen, um, we asked all our uh, teams and coaches to cut back their budget. So we put, we, we scrimped and saved that that's based the basic answer. But even with all that, we're still going to, I'll be honest, we're going to go over budget. Uh, we do have the Vandal scholarship fund that people have generously donated to, and we still are, you know, looking for donations there, but yeah, it hurts when you don't get those, those big uh, guarantee games and the numbers. And we just decided, and I visited with the president several times, Hey, do you want to play? It's going to cost us money. Do you want to play? And of course he said, yes. So we just tried to make sure that we didn't spend uh, overly spend, so to speak. And as a league, we work through, if you'll see or notice that not only is it uh, traveling in basketball and you go play out of school and play the games twice. So that cuts down in travel, but also health and safety. Volleyball is doing the same thing. We cut a lot of our sports back in numbers. I've told all the coaches don't, don't do anything that uh, you don't have to do. Save all the dollars that you can. So it's, it's been a work in progress this whole year. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Especially with budgets and how they are right now and <laughs> across countrywide with a, intercollegiate athletics or university terry kind of switch a little gears here talk about the football jerseys we've seen i think came out the other day um the new jerseys they did a photo shoot with them 
some got put onto Twitter. I, I'm still friends with a lot of the guys. So I see their, you know, private Snapchats or Instagrams. And I see, I think a lot of guys are pretty hyped and excited about those jerseys and, and the, the new pride gold kind of um, what went into the concept, you know, who designed them? What's, mm -hmm. what's the 401 on the new jerseys? People love them. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I'm glad they love them. I actually got a, uh, one of the uh, ADs at a, institution unnamed that's not playing football before they decided that said Woo, i really like your new jerseys i'm like whoa glad you do um a lot of things went into it one campus had a new branding campaign so that's with the boulder gold and i'll be honest we we had a look at i don't know six different designs i picked my favorite but that's not the one we're using but that's okay i wanted the i wanted the athletes to figure out which one they wanted and which which one the coaches wanted so i i think they're awesome looking jerseys as well i can't wait for the for the team to roll them out it'll be so fun and we were almost going to play a friday night game that was one of the options too we were going to try to do it friday night but alas our opponent didn't want to mm -hmm. so we're Are playing on are they wearing black for home games or will they might wear those whites for a home game? Are we going to see those maybe week one in the dome? I don't know. And if, if I did know, I couldn't tell you. I'm sure it's a secret, uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I kind of want to get into the, the nitty gritty of kind of like what you've been handling at the athletic department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of you came in very tough time to take a, you know, first role as an athletic director. Um, how did you go about maneuvering a pandemic in your first year to the point where we didn't have to cut any sports? We, for the most part, from what I've heard, have kept most people's jobs intact and had very minimal furloughs. Can you kind of talk about what it was like running the athletic department and how you and President Scott Green were able to really kind of not flourish, but, you know, really write it out better than some people have? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'll start with attitude, you know. Um, we are, it's funny cause we've been doing a, uh, we have a position open our department. So we had some zoom interviews today. That's what you do now. You zoom all the time. <laughs> and one of my staff members, the question that the uh, candidate asked was, well, what have you learned from COVID? And one thing I'll tell you guys about interviews when you're interviewing em employees, potential employees, it's interesting how your own staff answers the question. So one of the staff members said that, what they really appreciated about myself and our trainer and Scott Green was we're solution oriented. You know, don't just say, oh, we can't do it. Find a way, find a way to do it, find a way to practice, find a way to play. That's what we've been doing this whole time. And in, in a strange sort of way, I've really liked it because when you go through a pandemic or a situation, people rise up and you, you see their best selves. And sometimes you see what they're, you know, nuances are or what their weaknesses are, but you ask them to correct those and, and you got to keep a positive attitude. I told our coaches, don't panic. Don't respond to what's happening today. Let's just figure it out and move it along. And, and the other thing is don't, don't try to figure out why somebody else is doing it differently. Worry about what Idaho is doing. I worry about Idaho. I don't worry about anybody else. Speaking of Idaho, the, so during the first two years, uh, in football, you know, bouncing back to the big sky, I think we can reasonably say didn't go quite as well as a lot of people wish they had. But Idaho's a preseason top 25 team, which might be a surprise to some. Uh, for fans who've been paying pretty close attention, I don't think it's going to be that astonishing. But I guess what, what were your thoughts, Terry, when you first saw Idaho as a preseason top 25? Or if we just broke the news to you, what are your thoughts? Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited for our program. I'm excited for our coaches. I'm excited for the student athletes. They work really hard. Hopefully we can be knock on wood injury free and keep things rolling along. We've got excited, you know, some exciting players. But I think the other thing is, as coach Petrina and I were talking about how we handled uh, not exactly having practices like you'd want to, you know, because he's a, he's a worker kind of guy. He, he's a Montana boy through and through. And he really appreciated the time and energy that went into all the Zoom calls. And he sat in on all his staff, you know, when they have position Zoom calls, he sat in on every single one of them. So he could see not only how that coach was training the athletes, but the athletes. And I think that's really helped our program 
uh, be out in front of it and acquainted new younger people or if they're transfers to our system. So it's exciting. Yeah. And then we're going to, we're going to hit you with two quick little last questions, get you out of here. You know, what's been your favorite thing so far about the university of Idaho? The people, you know, without hesitation, I really enjoy the people I've been, I've met so many vandals through and through. I love the passion. Uh, I, lo I like going into the corner club. I don't go that often, but I do go down there and talk to the people. I, I've got a contractor I met at the corner club, the dude that's going to come do my forest I met at the corner club. I met a couple of other people at the corner club. So it's been, it's been fun to meet the community and the people. All right. Last question for you, Terry. Something that's kind of become a, a, an Idaho tailgating staple. Some say it's the best thing they've ever had. It's the Boatman Burger. Terry, is this the best burger you've ever had? My dad's my dad's famous for it. I think more people know him for his burger skills than for him being VSF president for two years. <laughs> well, Alex, I think I'm going to give you credit. I bet you came up with that Boatman Blue Cheese Burger. I wish. So I wish. It's my my mom's the, my mom's the real one who does it though. She makes. She uh, it. But is it the best thing you've ever had in the, in the Vandal tailgate? It has to be, right? It is. I'll say one of the best. Like you know, mm. I can't make. Can't, I can't All upset right. anybody. All and not choosing favorite. The other, right. only thing is, unfortunately, you guys, we won't be able to have tailgating. When we I know. Have, Fall, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. You know, I'm sure you guys will come up with something else. You know, off campus or whatever. So. Yeah, I know there. I guess I'm on a 14 day. I'm not doing anything. So I walked through the Kibbe Dome. Fine. <laughs> I was like, I'm not leaving the house other than work. Um, yeah. So <laughs> Terry, we want to thank you for coming on. Uh, before you leave, we have a segment on the show called Getting Ice. You just survived 20 minutes of us asking you questions. So we're going to give you a chance to fight back. You can ask all of us a question. It could be sports related or not. And we have to answer it. Wow. Okay, who wrote the song, the Diddy, your song for the show? <laughs> uh, so it's a random guy from the internet uh, website Fiverr, where you can like hire contractors. Okay. Um, I told him if he's ever listened to the Pat McAfee show, I wanted mm -hmm. it to sound like his intro, something that just gets stuck in your head, and you'll be humming it for like you know a couple minutes after you listen to the episode. And we've had like multiple people say it tell us that that's what's happened. So I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, Although a lot yeah, of people yeah. thought it was Brian Marceau and he like secretly had an emo band and wrote our song for us. <laughs> there you go. Secretly. Yeah. All right. Who has been the, who's been the best guest on your show? You mean other than you? Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I will say my favorite guest, I mean, Scott Green, obviously too, but uh, Rob Akey, just because yeah, he's really Rob who made me choose Idaho was Rob Akey's football teams. So sure. Rob Akey was fun. David Obora for me, he, he, cause he also does motivational speaking. So just listening to David talk makes you want to run through a wall and realize you can do so much more with your life probably and, <laughs> yeah, to, true, and see what he does. So they just, it, it's just a lot of inspiration from David. Yeah. yeah. Mine How is not close. Oh, mine's not close at all. It's Johnny ball game. Loved <laughs> listening to, to him when he was on the air in Moscow and I can't, I actually couldn't believe I'd forgot that he had a radio show. It's just, I don't live in Boise, so I don't hear Boise radio. Having him on was, oh man, it was just a trip down memory lane. Yeah. Oh, Kristen fine. Armstrong's an underrated episode too. That, yeah. that was a good one too. You don't get to talk to a gold medalist every day. So that's true. Well, that's um, true. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Terry, thank you for coming yeah. on. Um, thank you before, so much. I'll do it anytime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we let you go, is there anything you want to plug for the university or if people want to get a hold of you, how do they do it? Wow. Good question. Well, plug for the university. Um, two things. When you do come to campus, you know, wear your mask, social distance, all that. I have to cut a video about that. Oh, look at that. Um, and then obviously, um, we are looking for uh, increased enrollment, man. You guys, I know that uh, a lot of you guys on the screen donate. We appreciate that to VSF or the arena. I, I also am going to challenge everybody as my staff is in campus. We, we need kids on campus. So tell all your uh, friends who have younger sisters or whomever, come to Idaho because we're, we're rocking it. We got the campus open. We'll be in class next fall. So it'll be awesome. Cool. All right. Um, awesome. Well, Terry, thank you for having us or yep. coming on the show and uh, go sure. Vandals.
Thank you. Go Vandals. Thank you. All right, guys, that was athletic director for the University of Idaho, Terry Golick. And I'm not just saying this to be nice. That was one of my more favorite interviews. I was being honest when, when she asked that. Um, guys, I would say normally we would say let's debrief this, but we have such a stinking good episode to cover. It is time to get into Around the Bar, brought to you by Hughes River Expeditions. Brian Marceau, do you know what you and I were doing 363 days ago? 363 days ago. Two days short of a year by the time this episode releases. Oh, good Lord, man. Um, I'm just going to presume we were recording an episode. I am going to presume it was relating to the Big Sky Conference tournament, but I'm wrong. We were previewing the wide receiver group which we will be getting into now as we have <laughs> position groups. We have broken down the positions now twice between football seasons, but we're going to do it one more time quickly for you guys before we get into the schedules and give our projected win losses. Kicking it off, we have the quarterback room. And I don't remember who's doing quarterbacks. So is that Dallas? Dallas. It's Dallas, producer, Dallas. producer Hammer down. Dallas Dammer. Yeah, so this uh, this is going to be interesting for for Vandal fans. I know uh, we have talked at length about the dead horse, uh, so we won't try to dig that up too much. But we have lost uh, almost all of our quarterback production from last year. Uh, Mason Petrino graduated. He had twenty two hundred yards, eighteen touchdowns, nine interceptions, sixty three point nine percent completion rate. Uh, Colton Richardson is also taking the year off for health reasons. Uh, he was twenty nine and fifty three. 434 yards, two touchdowns, three picks. So what we have returning, Nikhil Nayers, three completions for 29 yards, and DJ Lee's one-for-one one trick pass for 26 yards. Uh, where that leaves us, uh, again, Nikhil Nayers returning, Nate Sisko is returning, DJ Lee is returning uh, as a receiver who had almost more yards than Nair. We have two guys to focus on this year, uh, with Nayer potentially getting some time, d depending on COVID. Uh, first name, Mike Beaudry. Uh, Mike Beaudry was announced as the starter on the first day of spring practice, so it, unless Petrino's pulling a fast one on us, this is going to be our guy. Uh, he's a grad transfer from UConn uh, through West Florida. Uh, he led the 2017 West Florida team to the D2 championship game before uh, he got injured there, transferred to UConn, got injured at UConn, transferred to Idaho. Uh, injury history, unfortunately, is something that, that has come with, with Beaudry. Uh, he was a second-team All-American when he led West Florida to the championship game. He was the first official signee in their program history, so he's at least been on teams that are building. Uh, Petrino said some nice things about him, really good arm, very accurate. He's put a lot of time in. He's got a chance to have a really good year. Uh, and then he's he's just continued to speak at length about his value as a, as a leader and how much he loves to study the game. Uh, this is going to be the guy, again, the grad, the grad transfer. But the other name to keep in mind here is Caleb C.J. Jordan. Uh, he's one of the most hyped Idaho recruits ever. Uh, he turned down Louisville, so a, a P5 school. He turned down plenty of G5 offers. Uh, I think UNLV was in there. Uh, Nevada was in there. He turned down some some decent programs to, to come be an Idaho Vandal, which uh, is fantastic. Uh, Petrino uh, just recently said about him in a press conference, he's got a bright, bright future here. He's going to do a lot of good things. He can really snap the snap the wrist and throw the ball. Um, my assumption is Beaudry is going to be the guy. CJ is probably not going to see the field this year. Maybe a, a little bit here and there in spot duty where they can preserve the red shirt and in 2022, trot him out there as a red shirt freshman with, with a bunch of experience. Uh, we've got some other newcomers, uh, Caden Frazier, Joey Fellini, McLeod Crouton, but realistically, this is going to come down to Beaudry, Jordan, and maybe Nair. Uh, so I've got some questions for you guys uh, because something we've talked about, we have not had a quarterback play the whole season since 2016. Uh, guys are getting hurt. The, the two quarterback system that we had a little bit with uh, with Richardson and Petrino, is Beaudry going to make it through the season as our guy? It's only six games, but is he going to make it through the season? Yes. Yes. I'm optimistic. Yes. If not, we got CJ and Nikhil, and everybody knows I'm a Nayer fan, so I'm we're fine. But, yeah, I think Beaudry, six games. 
I think we've had a quarterback at least last six games. With a three, three with a break months. between those three games. So yes. three, week off, three. Question is, 14 games when we win the playoffs. No, is it 12? Whatever. We're, we're playing more than six this year. It's a lot of math. <laughs> I did not major in math. Yeah. The other question I, I have for you guys, do we see C.J. Jordan at all this spring? Yes. I think yes. That's, yes. I think that's no question that – even though Idaho is all in, uh, as you know, is essentially the season's hashtag, Idaho has been one of the schools that has been more forthright about being all in. There's no way that we're not going to use part of the free eligibility year for development. And I mean, look, if let's say we're blowing out Southern Utah and we have the injury concern in Dallas, why wouldn't you throw the guy in mm-hmm. for a little bit? Or mm-hmm. we have any sort of trip, let's say, I mean, look, we have two good quarterbacks and this is great news in case a guy has a, rough enough outing that it's worth you know taking a break but i really i i think paul's definitely going to say yeah we've got a graduate transfer who's here for two seasons we have a freshman who's going to be here for essentially potentially five seasons we can develop for the present and the future at the same time i i guess the only thing i i i wonder is does it go Beaudry jordan nayer or Beaudry nayer jordan like something happens to mike you know, I don't, I don't know. Just knock on wood. Who does who does Petrino go with? I think that's the more really telling question. Um, <clears throat> is who's second on a depth chart? Probably varies, honestly, knowing Petrino and how he sees sees receive uh, sees his quarterbacks. So yeah, yeah. I was gonna, I'm with you, Alex. My whole question was, do we see Nikhil Nair this year? I think all three quarterbacks are going to get looks. I think any game we're up by 21 points with a couple minutes left in the. Fourth quarter, you're probably going to see C.J. Jordan going in. I think any game we're up a little bit bigger and we're just trying to preserve, that's when I think you're going to see Nikhil. I think we see all three quarterbacks take snaps this year. Plus, Nikhil Nair is playing a snap this never know. the past two years. So history yeah. would tell us he'll at least play in one game this year. Yep. Yeah. So. Is that it for quarterbacks? CJ. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, terrible habit of mine. Petrino has said that with COVID, he is expecting Beaudry, Jordan, and Nair all to be re- ready to play. He's mentioned all right. three of them by name. Uh, gonna just gonna need to prepare. Uh, the other question I have for you guys before we move on: How different could this offense look with with the arm of Mike Beaudry running it? Uh, completely different. I've heard he can make every throw. That's I mean, from people I've talked to, I've heard he makes every throw, checks all the boxes. So. Yeah, it's this offense. It's going to be more like what how Paul likes to call games. Honestly, he 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 likes to have a tool bag of what he wants to call. Um, he wants to be able to stretch the field. He wants to be able to run deep out routes, things like that. He it's more of a nice pro style West Coast system that he will spread out. So I think we're going to see a lot what it looked like with Matt Linehan. Expect to see that with Mike Bowdry. Oh, I think even more. I I think you're yeah. going to see what. Jake Luton was supposed to be what this offense was supposed to be with a guy like Jake Luton. Tall, is- big mm-hmm. arm, surprisingly athletic. This is what we would have been seeing for a couple of years now. Uh, that's my opinion, at least. Yeah. Well, yeah. My, my answer to that is just going to be it's about damn time. But that's great news. I think, look, Idaho's issue last, one of the issues last couple of years is our offense has been way too predictable for the obvious thing issue with not being able to spread the field. That should be a non-issue now. All right. All right. Is that it? all it on quarterbacks? That's it. We're on to the ball carriers. Yes. The running backs, the athletic linebackers, which might not apply to this <laughs> team, but to many teams. I got these guys. And let me tell you, this is a great group. Uh, your Vandal fans, happy, happy with your running back situation because <clears> – <throat> Uh, maybe Weber State. I don't know if anyone has a better running back situation in the conference. Um, real quick, not returning Andre Carter. Um, he was our biggest producer last year. Rushed for over 600 yards, seven touchdowns, 5.4 average. Um, he will not be with the team this spring. Has potential come back in the fall. Told it's more of an eligibility type of thing. So who knows what that is. So hopefully Andre can get things squared away and we see him back in the fall. But besides that, man, we got three great dudes returning, starting off Nick Romano, true sophomore out of Rocky Mountain High School in, in uh, Meridian. Last year, Nick, 513 yards on the ground, two touchdowns, played in all 12 games. He's the only running back actually last year to play in all 12 games. This was a pretty ri- injury-riddled group last year. 
Um, and then in the last game last year, I'm sure we all remember that, NAU, Nick himself had 286 all-purpose yards, which is the fourth most in Idaho history in a single game. He also averaged 5.1 yards a rush. So our top two rushers averaged over five yards a carry last year, which is great to see. Other two names, look out for Roshan Johnson, redshirt junior out of Arizona. Um, last year, 51 rushes, 239 yards, two touchdowns. And he did not see any conference play last year. Um, Roshan, the big sky, did not get to see Roshan last year. There he is right there, one of his two rushing touchdowns. Uh, that's against Wyoming. Um, Roshan's a big dude, 6'1", 240, super athletic, really strong. Um, he comes back. Oh, he might take a little bit of that Andre role, and we might see him get more on those higher touchdown areas. Um, another one to look out for, Dylan Thigpen. Love Thig. Thig actually sustained a really massive knee injury. That uh, was that spring of 2017. He had to go to Houston, Texas. Have I think he had like torn meniscus, torn ACL, just complete knee re- reconstruction. Awesome to see him bounce back. Last year only played in seven games due to a slight injury, but he ran for 278 yards on 57 carries, one touchdown. So <laughs> a lot of information came at you. But those three guys, you take out Andre Carter, big loss. But those three guys still combined for over 1,000 yards last year, and they all hit about five yards of carry. Anytime you're running back, you're hitting five yards of carry, getting over 1,000 yards. That's great to see. Um, maybe a quick potential breakout last year. Um, he's a true freshman. Last year, he kept his red shirt under the new NCAA rule, played in four games, named Keon Martinez, a uh, smaller guy out of Arizona, but he had nine carries for 43 yards, one catch for nine, returned two kicks. But the fact that we saw Petrino play him in all four games, use his max four game, shows you they obviously rate this kid very highly. To get him on the field as a true freshman, he only does that for guys he really likes. I think they actually contribute. Um, another name to look out for, maybe Khalil Forehand. Uh, Khalil uh, from BK down in Boise. Um, played a little special teams last year. Will he get first carry this year? I don't know. So, Idaho running backs return a thousand yards. You lose your leading rusher, but he can be back in the fall. Um, this is a group dealt with injuries last year, but short short season, bye week in the middle. This group stays healthy. Outside of Weber State, we might have the best group and stable of running backs in the conference. Yeah, I mean, my my takeaways on this is we're set. I mean, you you hit it. Losing Andre Carter is good. I hadn't heard that. It's just an eligibility thing. He could be back. That would be yeah. awesome because he was – he's the kid who put Kalen Kreiner into disco mode on the Kibbe Dome <laughs> turf last year. Um, but like you said, Nick Romano, Roshan, uh, Martinez is very – just because it was such a deep room last year, a guy who played in four right. games specifically to keep that red shirt but was definitely useful. And then Thigpen coming back is a guy that can do it. I've said it now for three straight years – Roshan Johnson, every year we project to have, do big things, and he just deals with some things. I hope this year, and with the extended layover that we've had, mm-hmm. disco mode, um, I think he could probably stay healthy this year. I expect him to take the majority of the carries, and Nick Romano kind of be that change of pace back. Yeah, if they stay healthy, it's a great group. If they stay healthy, it mm-hmm. is probably, other than Weber State, probably the best group. This yeah. is also a group I'd be – this is the single group. I would be the least shocked to see a more equitable split than we would if this were a traditional season. Mm-hmm. Really just, again, we already talked about issues of injuries, but we have some guys who've produced. So I, I, I don't see any reason why the coaches again, wouldn't view this as a both developmental and a safety thing, because look, if Roshan's not playing, it's not like we're taking a gigantic step back with Nick Romano. And from what we saw out of Keon Martinez, he's absolutely a sufficient or quality big sky back. So I, I guess my the thing I'm going to be watching for is what does the split look like throughout the season? Yeah. One thing I love about this group is how their sizes are all different. You know, I, I think I got a list here. Nick Nick is um, – man, how big is Nick? He's only 5'10", 203. Roshan's 6'1", 240. And, and I forget, Thigpen is probably like 6'2", 220, 210. So we have a kind of a th- – and then Keon Martinez I think is only 5'8", or 5'7". So – Anything you want and need out of this group, you have it. So I think the where I'm worried the most is who takes that goal line production. Because obviously Andre got it last year, seven touchdowns. Row. The next closest mm-hmm. per, you hope it's row, you know. Yeah. Um, you hope it's row, but you know, to replace seven touchdowns and that's your main goal line guy, 
yeah, so Rose have to have to big step up and get those touchdowns um, this spring. Uh, Martin, Dallas, takeaways on the running backs? I I think I, you guys already stated it. They are loaded, and I think it, even if, say, one goes down, there's still going to be one guy. There's still mm-hmm. going to be someone that will be able to fill that role, and you won't notice it. You won't be able to be like, oh, there's someone else in there. There's just going to be someone that's going to step in and just plug and play. Yeah. Yeah, I've got – I've got nothing extra to add other than if anybody here ever played NCAA 14 and downloads the Operation Sports rosters, uh, last year's team, Keon Martinez, was one of the fastest players they had on that roster. So that those guys are always accurate, so Martinez could definitely <laughs> break out. Yeah, they do better than the actual guys. That's that's fact. For <laughs> I used to do this for in high school. It was like a living, so operation sports there's something there and if anyone's um, curious it's inside info like that that got dallas on this team exactly it is it 100 percent is <laughs> all right we did it for you 363 days ago on february 20th on the episode labeled the kings and queens of Cheney and the 2020 wide receiver spotlight brian marceau tell us about these past catchers yeah chris we're combining wide receiver tight end because uh realistically we only have a couple tight ends listed on tight ends who have much production. The This group, to me, is the single one that is going to look – it's going to tie with quarterback, I guess, for being the most different this year, very likely, than it was last year. And part of the reason why is last year we essentially had a two-man wide receiver game. Of We had Jeff Cotton, 88 receptions, and Cottrell Haywood, 60%, 60 receptions. No one else had any more than 25 receptions, and we lost Jeff Cotton's 88 catches, 1,100 yards, seven touchdowns, and 114 yards per game. So question for us this season is, who's going to replace that production, and what kind of step does Cottrell Haywood take as now our presumptive number one wide receiver? A couple names for for us to look at because I think – we're not going to have a single guy make up for Jeff Cotton's production. Jeff Cotton's a pro. And similar to when um, UC Davis lost – Chris, give me the UC Davis wide Keelan receiver. Doss. Name. Similar to when UC Davis lost Keelan Doss, you, no team in the Big Sky has a backup pro who wasn't playing last year. So for Idaho, a couple things to look at. Last year, our top running back pass catcher was Nick Romano, 16 receptions, 171 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, Keon Martinez also might figure into the passing game from the running back position too, but Nick Romano has already done that. So, but, so will Nick Romano receive a few more catches? I don't know. Uh, top returning tight end is Connor Whitney, 25 catches last year, 314 yards, two touchdowns, 26 yards per season. He's another candidate to take, not necessarily a gigantic leap, but to maybe mix with Cottrell Haywood taking a little jump, Nick Romano taking a little jump, and Connor Whitney taking a little jump, and suddenly you've taken a big bite out of those 88 receptions that we lost out of Jeff Cotton. A couple key newcomers for us to look at, we have Jermaine Jackson Jr. from the College of San Mateo, famous for being featured on Last Chance U, which uh, doesn't tell us what kind of receptions he's going to have, but hey, he was on TV, so that's cool. He... Colton Clark describes him as being a pretty shifty, real quick, um, east-west wide receiver. Another guy who may uh, take a bite out of the production is Elijah Lilly, red, redshirt senior, graduate transfer from New Mexico, who I believe is also going to see a little bit of action on special teams. Couple, A few other potential contributors to look at who were on the team last year. We've got sophomore Sean McCormick. We have redshirt freshman DeSal Puffer who at 6'4 was a guy we talked about actually last year as fingers crossed. Maybe he's maybe a big target like that is going to start to pull down a few receptions and returning uh, redshirt sophomore, Michael Noyle. And last fun fact before really we go over who's going to, who else is going to get these catches. We have a ton of local guys at the wide receiver position, which isn't precisely new, but we've got 10 guys right now listed as wide receiver from either Idaho or Eastern Washington. According to Colton Clark, none of those guys project as real contributors this year. But uh, it's just – right. it is just – you know what? You're 100% right, Alex, but it's still fun to look through the roster and yeah. see Spokane Valley and see right. Grangeville. Hey, and at one point, 
Max Komar was a walk-on from somewhere in Washington. So, not saying that they won't make it either. Yeah. Yeah, this group, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, Brian, I think you said maybe outside of quarterback. I'd also say maybe outside of defensive back. It's where we know the least in terms of who these key contributors are and who's going to step up. And everyone goes, you know, how do you replace Jeff? How do you replace Jeff? Yeah, Jeff's a pro. Jeff's still in the league right now. You know, he's on practice squad. But, hey, there's very few guys that make it that far in their football career. Um, but one thing I have heard is that I think actually the lack of Jeff – is actually going to make this group better. And some people might go, how is that possible? I think last year so, some of those guys who were around the program kind of got complacent where they knew the ball was going to Jeff, and if it wasn't, it was going to Cottrell. And that's kind of what happened, and they kind of guys kind of went back into their shell. One thing I've heard this has done is actually bring guys out and make them better players and make them their own receivers and make them kind of stand out more. Um, so I think that's what's going to happen. And honestly, Cottrell Haywood might have the best pair of hands – in the conference, like that guy, you just one of those guys you can go up there and get the ball, and he's going to go get it or get to have a chance with it. And I've heard yeah. Jermaine Jackson is gonna is is legit, and don't be surprised to see him on the field. And kind of a hint, Petrino usually doesn't usually does not give out the number one or let someone take the number one unless he thinks you're going to contribute and going to do something. So that's kind of always who's wearing one because guys want to wear one for some mm -hmm. reason. Can't who lets actually, yeah, who actually wants to wear one, he lets wear one. That's usually a good hint of uh, who he thinks can contribute. Yeah, my, my big takeaways on this wide receiver group, and I'll just be quick. How does Cottrell Haywood handle being a true number one? Uh, two years ago, him and Cotton kind of split it. Last year, Cotton ran away with it. Uh, Cottrell obviously still got good numbers. He is going to be the guy that teams are going to try to shut down this year. How does he handle that? Uh, and then... I want to see how Hatton makes the transition from being a tight end last year to wide receiver this year. I think that will be interesting to see because Petrino's talked about him a lot as somebody to expect taking kind of that third or fourth rung at wide receiver. So that's kind of where I'm at. I want to see maybe how Hatton transitions from being a tight end. But, I mean, we saw it. Deion Watson transferred from, like, tight end to wide receiver back to tight end. So Petrino's moved guys around depending on the season, and I don't think anyone's going to argue that Deion Watson had a bad career. So, I that's those are my takeaways. Yeah. Dallas Martin, anything? No, I think you you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think it'll be that's one thing I was kind of wanting to think about. Like, how is Cottrell going to handle being a a number one guy? Yeah. All right. Well, Martin, if that's it, me offensive line. Yeah. Well, when I was doing my research, I. I was surprised. I didn't realize how many people, I wouldn't say, left or transferred out. I didn't figure that out. But, like, I know some, like, just kind of go over some of the returning players that have played in, gosh, 2019. Wow, it's, it's too long. Uh, I think returning, like, Jed Oskover, like, Logan Floyd, he played in all 11 games, was it? 12 games? He played in 11 games, started with 10 of them. Matthew Fapusa played an eight, missed some time, played an eight. Seth Carnahan played in 10. Noah Gunn played in one, and that was just the – Noah Gunn played in just the one game, which I'm pretty sure was the Penn State game, if I remember right. And then uh, Darius Archie played in five and started three. And I kind of thought it was just kind of uh, – like, I the one thing question I had going into like, – doing this was like who's gonna who's gonna replace Noah Johnson because he played four years he started all four years just kind of having that playing that like who started who's gonna who's gonna replace Noah Johnson is kind of like that don't say bell cow who's who's just who's gonna take his role on the offensive line the newcomers some of the newcomers I'm probably gonna see some playing time Chad Bagwell Elijah Sanchez and uh, Nate as a, as a party. I know they're kind of like the three I'd probably think are probably going to start maybe as a freshman. <laughs> but yeah, it's another one I've kind of like just in the research. There's potential maybe to have three new starters on the offensive line this year. Probably. I would, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's going to probably be some new faces this year. 
Yeah, I know. Uh, for me, one, I think Darius Archie on the presser I was on still was dealing with maybe being in a quarantine of some sorts. Obviously, they couldn't touch on it, but yeah. that's the the vibe I got. Um, I could be totally wrong on that. I know he's with the team, but wasn't practicing, which in today's age, that's kind of the two and two I put together. Uh, my projected starters on this was I had Noah Gunn on the left tackle. I had Darius Archie at left guard. I think you probably move him at this point. I've heard Azapati is probably a guy that like, once in a generational type dude that we've got as a freshman. So probably he'll slide in at left guard. If I was guessing, uh, Chad Bagwell, I'm pretty sure has been solidified as a yeah. starting center. Papusa, Papusa is supposed to be starting right guard. And then Logan Floyd moved back outside the tackle from center last year. Yeah. I believe he's probably going to be named captain of this team. Um, he seems to kind of taken the offense as like mm-hmm. the mean energy guy. Yeah. Um, so I know that's that's how I yeah. see the line going. I know I kind of I had the same thing in my kind of off notes was just I had Logan Floyd at tackle, Fapusa at guard, Bagwell at center. I I I won't say bold, but I kind of said Nate as a party is going to start as another guard, and then I kind of I kind of I didn't really think about that, but like I kind of thought maybe Seth Carnahan, or I know I heard some stuff about Elijah Sanchez maybe playing as a true freshman as well. Kind of those yeah. are my kind of five six guys that are probably going to see time this year. Yeah, um, and the way Idaho does the O-line is different than a lot of a lot of schools, so we don't have like designated right, left tackles or guards. It's uh, called strong or weak – or strong or, qu- strong or quick. So they, they change sides constantly. Um, that's just Petrino's system. So, yeah, you've pretty much heard so far in press conferences that he's basically given Chad Bagwell and Logan Floyd starting jobs. Like pretty much as clear as day is what he gave Mike Bozier saying he's a starter. Chad Bagwell will start at center. Logan Floyd, I think he's going to say he started strong tackle. Um, wouldn't be surprised if we see Matt play as the other guard. He he was he's been there for a few years, played in a lot of games, seen a lot of action. Um, Nate has a party. That's someone that I'm excited about. Don't know a whole lot about, but if everything sounds right, he could be a really great contributor. And usually, plugging a freshman in to guard is a lot easier than plugging him into tackle, just because. As we know, in the NFL, the second highest paid position group in the whole league is left tackle because how important it is to have one-on-one pass blocking. Really, really difficult. Playing guard, interior line's a lot different. Um, so who starts another tackle? Don't know. I've heard everything else. Is, I've heard Bagwell and Floyd are pretty much solidified. Everything else is completely up in the air. <laughs> pretty much what they've told us is what is is actually what's happening. So. Hopefully, I'm hoping um, we have a solid starting five, maybe six or seven dudes that they can rotate and figure out going forward. Anybody else got comments on the line? Only comment is this is a group when we had Colton Clark on to close last season. Um, Idaho's line relative to what was expected heading into the start of last season underperformed a little bit. It wasn't what you'd call awful or anything, but it was – in terms of like sacks given up. And also we did see um, Mason have to scramble a ton last year um, in a way that we, of course, wish was not the case. Uh, we talked about quarterback being new. We talked about wide receivers, all that. This is probably the most important offensive group to me. Yeah. yeah. And, hey, don't forget, and we're talking about as a party, we're we're left guard you. Well, our quick strong guard, I don't know. We got Slareth and we got Iapati, so and Kramer. And so. I mean, as I say, Jerry Kramer, just guard yeah. you. Let's go, let's just, go with guard. Just forget the Hall of Famer. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, moving on Whoa. to. I appreciate this because I'm putting together the Big Sky Podcast recruiting thing. You know, the last couple of days, which you guys are aware, but the listeners might not. And you guys gave me the easiest group to talk about, so thank you. We're talking about the front seven. We're looping them together because we run a three-four system, which means. One or two of our linebackers basically function as your defensive end. Um, but it's also – there's very little guessing that's going to have to happen on the front seven. Um, so we'll start with the defensive line, though. Guys, I'm sure you're – or if you're following along on this, sorry. But if not, play along with me for those of you that don't know. How many tackles do you think we lost on the 2019 defensive line? D-line? Yeah. Man, less than one hand. Like, just I don't know if we lost it. I'm trying to think about who even graduated. I can't, no one's even coming to my mind. So, not that many. <laughs> we lost 
four tackles. Okay, yeah. That's we lost four tackles from our defensive line that was already good last year. So we're pretty well set. Uh, my starters, projected starters, the guys you need to know, number 45, redshirt senior, Coyote Rufai. Um, I actually projected him in the spring. In fact, I'll just ruin it for everybody. The three dudes I'm going to name as your projected nose, D, and D end, uh, our defense tackle, are – same three guys I gave you in like last April, but whatever. Uh, Coyote Rufai, my projected starting DN, former Boise State player. He's also the trans uh, brother of Majib Rufai, who's playing in our secondary. Uh, he played in 19 games for the Broncos over two seasons. Last year, kind of dealt with a little bit of injury. Um, played in eight games, started in seven of them. Hopefully, we see him bounce back this year. Uh, he really allowed for a guy later I'll talk about to really shine a little bit. Uh, then you've got... Number zero, big O, according to Tyrese Deadman, that'd be Rasan Crawford, uh, redshirt well, senior, Sean. big Sean, and you'll you'll see you're gonna see very senior laden in the in the D line, which is good for now. We'll, recruiting, hopefully for good day. for the fall. Hopefully yeah, good for the good fall. For the fall. Uh, my projected nose tackle here, uh, I picked him for thirty. He played thirty five games in the past three seasons. Uh, stats don't necessarily show it. He's more of one of those disruptor types. Uh, he's maybe not going to get the tackle. He's maybe not going to get the sack, but he clogs the whole forces the running back to go elsewhere where the linebackers can clean it up. Uh, and also just kind of gets that pressure where he's getting the quarterback to also do the same thing where the pocket's going to break down at the middle, forcing them to get on their sides like an Eric Barrier type, which is why Charles Ocano had such a great game last year is you look all the pressure we're getting up the middle led to Ocano being able to kind of pick him off as Barry was kind of breaking out of the pocket. So a guy that stats don't really show, but a huge contributor to this line. Um, then you have number 98, Jonah Kim, who's a guy who just really capitalized on some injuries last year, um, but really solidified himself as the obvious starter here in my mind. He's also the guy that Brian Marceau picked as the starter when we did this episode in the spring. Uh, kind of came out of nowhere in 2019. Uh, had 32 tackles. He played in all 12 games in 2019. Other key contributors you need to know. Number 99, redshirt junior Noah Ellis. Uh, Brian projected him as a starter last spring. Probably still has a chance to this spring. Um, but it sounds like, listen to Bresky today, that's not going to be the case. Um, former three-star, I remember it being a four-star. He had a .8893 on the 247 composite ranking, which would have made him like – like our fourth highest recruit ever. Uh, he was the number 22 defensive tackle in the nation committed to Mississippi State. I know what you're saying. Oh, that's a big deal. He turned down offers to Alabama, Auburn, Notre Dame, Oregon, USC, UCLA, Utah, Arizona State, BYU, Colorado, Nebraska, Louisville, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Oregon State, TCU, Utah State, Washington, and Idaho. So it's not like Mississippi State was his best offer and he just went with it. He was highly sought after from multiple power teams and what? Oregon, Alabama, Auburn, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, the majority of the college football playoff, Washington, offered this guy scholarships. So he's a freaking stud. He's dealt with some injuries. Uh, we got him due to maybe some academics, plus obviously the family connection. Uh, a guy a lot of us expect to just really explode if it all comes together. The good news is, due to that academic eligibility issue, he's only a redshirt junior. So he's not losing any eligibility this year. He gets to play again next year, and he gets to play again um, in the following fall of 22. And he's Christian's age. I believe they came in at the same class, to put that in perspective. Oh, yeah, the so, same age. Yeah, so yeah. he's Christian's age, and we'll have him as like a 24 or 5-year-old if he sticks around, which is helpful. We'll be like a Weber State for once. Um, Vea Tomasi, a guy just to keep your eye on. He's a Laney College guy, as uh, Brian Marsal brought, brought up in the pass catchers with the College of San Mateo. They were featured, but the actual key team was Laney College with Coach John Beam. So he's a product of Beam Ball. And then you got number 94, the local product out of Post Falls, Nate DeGraw. Uh, he's Brian Marceau's other pick to be a starter last spring. He had 40 tackles in 2019. Yeah. He's played in 23 games in the past two seasons. A guy that, if there is an injury on the front, I think is your automatic plug-and-play guy to be the starter going forward. Linebackers. Um, oh, the one thing I think this – these guys need to improve on ability to actually get to the quarterback and take him down between everybody. There was only about like four recorded sacks maybe last year out of the defensive line position. You'd like to see a little bit more than that. Although I know with the three, four, you're relying more on your pass rush to come from your linebackers. Speaking of linebackers, how many tackles you guys think we lost from the linebacking core from last year? Nine. 
You read ahead. We lost uh, six <laughs> from Robert Miller and three from Christian Blackburn. We also had seven tackles from uh, Terry something from Sandpoint, but he was a special teamer, so I didn't count him in actual linebacker tackles. So we lost nine tackles that include what should be three All-Americans. I'm throwing it out there. I'm shocked or not. We'll start with the obvious one. Number one, Christian Ellis. He's a true senior. Probably going to be your starter at Sam. 2019, first team, all big sky. He had 104 tackles, 12.5 for loss. That was good for second on the team. He was a he is a preseason hero sports top pro prospect in the FCS at the Big Sky Conference. Uh, he is also hero sports top returning linebacker in the Big Sky Conference. Absolute animal. He's partnered up with who's most likely going to play your your Mike, uh, number eight, Trey Walker, true junior. He's played every game since he's been here. No red shirt, true. 138 tackles last year, nine tackles for loss, 74 solo tackles, which makes him a top five returning player in the entire FCS in solo and total tackles. I think he's number two in solo and number five on total. So absolute animal, a way to get to the ball. If you like Dante Olsen, if you like uh, all those Josh Buss and all these guys that Montana have had, Trey Walker is that dude who gets those tackles. But as the difference between him and Dante Olsen was, he has solo tackles where Dante Olsen had a lot of total tackles. This guy can bring a dude down on his own. No questions asked. Then you have number seven, Charles O'Connor, redshirt senior. Kind of the, the worst part about last year was the fact that he got hurt because he was on pace for a first-team All-American bid. Um, he's probably going to be your starting buck. By probably, I mean he's absolutely going to be your starting buck. He eight games last year before suffering against uh, injury against Idaho State. That was in the eighth game of the year. It took until week 10 for somebody to pass him in total tackles for a loss. He led the nation for two weeks without even playing. That's how many tackles for a loss he had already accumulated before that injury had happened. Um, he also led the team with four forced fumbles. Other guys you need to know. We have a we have to know number three, Fave Fave is a redshirt junior. He's probably going to be starting at will, but also probably play a little bit of buck, um, depending because we like to really run a rotation. Uh, He's a Wazoo transfer. He's also a product of Modern Day High School down in Carson, California. He also played 10 games as a freshman for Washington State and seven games for Washington State the year after that as a sophomore, um, but also had some drama on his leaving. He left before the season was over, so he probably would have logged more games also as a sophomore. Then you have number 11, Jalen Jenkins. He's a senior, seven games. He started in four. Number 20, Sully Shannon, who's a true sophomore. He played in 11 games as a freshman. Uh, he had two starts and 30 tackles. Leo Tamba played in all 12 games last year, started in seven, 36 tackles. Number 43, Derek Tomasi, who's a local Eagle Mustang. Uh, Paul Petrino has been on record talking about him as the guy who's most likely to see playing time as a true freshman, probably going to be your next Christian or Caden Ellis, um, which is big shoes to fill, but could probably fill him. He, uh, also a special year. He's a guy to really keep an eye on. As we touched on with the eligibility thing, he's a guy who can play a lot this year, and then you can kind of save him if most of this team comes back next year, only play him in four games, and then you have him as a tr uh, red shirt freshman starting 22 with C.J. Jordan and all these other dudes we brought in in our previous recruiting classes. So big guy to keep an eye on. It'll be curious to see how they use him, and you probably won't see him very much in 2022. And then last but not least, number 10, Coleman Johnson is an All-American guard. Uh, or sorry, he's the brother of All-American guard, <laughs> Noah Johnson. Uh, and he played in eight games last year. Expect to see a bigger role this year. I had to hit the depth because we have the depth. We're not going to spend too much time on him. Guys, We got you, you got basically your big five dudes here, um, as in – Rufi, Kim, Ellis, Ellis, Walker, Akano. Actually, there's more than five. Thoughts and takeaways on this. Just I, you guys gave me the easiest group. They're okay. stacked. They can do no wrong. The only takeaway I have, just kidding, but is that our four starting linebackers all wear numbers in the single digits. Think about that. Mind blown. Sorry. It's my mind first win. Like I said, um, running backs are the athletic running backs, except maybe not but, in this case. Our linebackers are pretty athletic. But Charles Ocano, I don't think people quite understand how good. Like Trey, Trey and Christian get a lot of love. Chuck does too, but man, Chuck, you talk, you talk to like if you talk to like guys who who played, whether it be like Ed or Caden, they tell you that Chuck's like really special at what he does. His just for some reason, Chuck and that Buck position, Chuck's at Buck. Um 
it's probably the best fit we've ever had in that position since we have gone to that with Bresky in 2015. Uh, Kalen Smith played there. Uh, Lenny Haywood, Caden played there a little bit. Um, we kind of rotate, but Chuck is probably the best buck we have ever had. And he's probably actually the best linebacker in this group. So, and that's saying something. Yeah. Over under on the entire front seven, how many first, second, third team, just in hero sports end of the year, especially with the teams not out, how many all Americans are there across uh, the three front, teams from this front seven? Yeah. Through two or three, unfortunately, they'll, they'll, they'll get yeah, us they'll two or power. Three. We're not NDSU, so I'd I'm say going four. with two. I'm going four. Dude, none of them no, are even preseason. They're, 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 gonna 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 they're gonna statistically cannibalize each other uh, as yeah. far as like all American type of births. But Alex, I wanna I wanna go back on what you're talking about, Chuck Akano. Uh, when he went down last season, he yeah. was among the lead league league leaders in the big sky. And seriously, just about every single defensive metric. And he still stayed there for a few weeks after. Uh, particularly if you watch the Weaver State game, I I was floored at how disruptive Chuck O'Connell looked against – again, uh, Weaver State made the Final Four last year. And, yeah, Chuck O'Connell made them look like they were, I don't know, going to yeah. compete with Southern Utah for the role of who gets to leave the big sky first. Against an All-American running back in Josh Davis. Yeah. Like, it's not a slouch yeah. there either. And the all star quarterback and Jake Constantine. I beat you to your own joke. Oh, God. <laughs> Hammer, Martin takes on the linebackers before we move into the last couple. And then we predict predict the uh, the season here. Really good. Yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's a pretty good way to put it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just to back up what yeah. Boatman was saying, watching the games last year uh, as a season ticket holder, those, for, those first few games watching Chuck Akano, I was like, mm-hmm. oh, my goodness. This is. This is a guy that might have a shot beyond Idaho. It, that guy is something special. Yeah. It, honestly, even though Chuck's probably the best for what we do, I think Christian, Christian in terms of what he can go into the next level. I actually I, I uh, talked to Christian um, the other day. I asked him, Christian, or I was talking to Caden the other day. I'm like, how much is Christian weigh? And he's like, 230, about 235. So anytime your Sam linebacker can weigh 235, be about 6'3, and also probably and be that athletic. You're doing good. <laughs> you're in a good. You're in a good spot um, where your linebacking core core is at. I will still contest that our linebacking core in 2016, 2017 with Ed, Tony, and Caden is better than this linebacking core minus Chuck. Chuck just t- puts this one, I guess, over the top a little bit. So that's all um, I got to say. Yeah. The last thing to put here, Jamie Schultz is just seeing uh, dollar juice. signs for a promotion, man. Uh, if you get stuck with this linebacker group, <laughs> you can't do wrong. I mean, what do you even yeah. coach them? Hey, you yeah. just – you keep being Doing really good. Uh, love juice. <laughs> All right. Uh, Boatman. Yeah, I get to wrap Who's this up with – replacing Lloyd Hightower? Oh, man, I get to wrap this up with secondary and then ST. Secondary. All right, real quick. There are 24 guys listed on our roster as playing corner or safety. It's like I the wide probably- receivers. I probably did research on about 16 of them. That's that's how in-depth I had to go. Um, biggest loss, Chris already mentioned it, Lloyd Hightower, captain of the team last year, one of the captains. Played 47 games in his Idaho, Idaho career, 13 pass breakups in 2019, which was third in the big sky, which is impressive because Lloyd barely got thrown at because teams knew he was our best corner. So um, really tough to lose. Also, he's now one of the defensive GAs on the team. So I love seeing Lloyd around. His biggest moment's career, real quick. That's when talk some crap about Lloyd. 2016, his first game he ever played at UW. We had the opening oh, kickoff. I remember that. Buda Baker put a lick on Lloyd. Fumbled the ball. They scored two plays later. But uh, I still want a fancy football league with Lloyd. So I, we remind him of that every day. <laughs> um, but some prominent returners. Someone we've already kind of seen as a, as a face of the program towards the media, Tyrese Dedman. At safety, he started all 12 games in 2019. There he is, number 27 right there. Um, he's third on the team with 60 tackles. He had two INTs, and he's played in 33 games in his Idaho career. So he's seen a lot of action. Another one, Jalen Hoover did not leave the program. Um, he did put in for a transfer request. Um, I hear it was, you know, some family issues, things like that, maybe closer to home, things got resolved. He's staying in Moscow. We have Hoover at least through the spring, hopefully in the fall. He's back. He's had 50 tackles 
in both in every year he's played so far, at least 50 tackles, I think like 51, 54, and 50, which is really impressive for a safety. And then last year he had 10 pass breakups. So we're returning some good depth at safety. Um, and this is where things get tricky. Uh, I had to do get, get some information from some people, really have to hone in on who's playing where because this group after that, we do not know a lot of these names. Some names to be on the lookout for. And this one I'm hearing really good things about is Awan Parker. Expect him to maybe nail down, nail down one of the starting corner roles. Um, he was a Juco last year. He's a junior this year. Played at L.A. Valley College. Some other names in the rotation. I'm hearing it's mainly going to be rotation. We're going to see, especially at first, to kind of nail down who's going to be playing where. Uh, another name to look out for, Jackson Woodward. Um, safety. Retro sophomore. Jackson's from Seattle, Seattle Prep. Played 11 games in 2019, mainly on special, special teams. Really athletic kid. And he's so athletic, he actually has appeared in 10 games for the men's basketball team in 2019-2020 season uh, when they actually had won some games. So that's that's where Jackson was at. Probably would have been with him this year, barring our season having to get moved to spring. Um, a name that Vandal fans are probably not familiar with, Ryan Swanson at safety. So Ryan... He transferred to Idaho. He actually took over my room lease. This is the guy who he moved. He came to Moscow um, January 2019. Transferred from Boise State as a safety. Got hurt in spring ball. I think he tore his ACL or, or did something with his knee. So he's had to set the whole 2019 year. He was at Boise State the year before that. Didn't play because he had to set out due to transfer rules where he had transferred to, from Portland State. So signed with Portland State out of high school from Eagle. Had to go back to Boise for family reasons. Had to sit out a year. Wasn't going to play there, see some action. Got a chance to leave, come to Idaho. So he hasn't played in a while, but someone I'm, I've heard good things about really fast, extremely fast. All state and track when he back was in the, in high school in Idaho. Um, another name to look out for at corner, Arnell Walker. So he's a freshman. It just listen as a true freshman on the website. He's from the class of 2019, so I don't know if he may be gray-shirted. Um, or what that deal is, but this is his true freshman year. He turned down offers from Bowling Green and Northern Illinois, so he turned down two MAC schools out of Orlando to come to Moscow, so another strong Florida connection for us. Um, don't be surprised to see him at corner. Tommy McCormick, the brother of Sean McCormick, um, true freshman out of Nevada. Expect to see him at safety this year. Josh Jones, a transfer from UTSA before that, Tyler College. Hearing good things of him at corner. Same with Marcus Harris, a retro freshman at Oregon State. I just named a lot of dudes who can contribute because mm -hmm. that's where the secondary is at. It's it's pretty much a free-for-all, up for grabs. Whoever nails on that spot is going to get a spot. But we will see some rotation. So familiarize yourself with these names. Some other returners, key contributors we could see. Warrior Noyle, um, brother of Mike Noyle. Warrior's been on the team for quite a few years now. He's a DB redshirt junior. He played in eight games in 2019. Heard he's been playing well so far in spring camp, fall camp, whatever you call it. Another one, T. Duke, Tevin Duke. I feel like Tevin's been there forever. Um, but he's finally a senior. Uh, plays a lot of special teams. Um, plays some rotates in the corner. He's played in 34 games in his Idaho career, so he's someone that they have leaned on when we were even FBS. And then Majib Rufai, um, the brother of Coyote, who Chris mentioned earlier, uh, Majib last year. He's also transferred from Boise State. He's a richer sophomore. He played in six games. Kind of onto an area um, where these guys probably won't be seen too much of or, or won't be seen at all. But first, an old comer of, of name that is so familiar with everyone on allvandals.com, Zach Borish. <laughs> Will we see Zach Borish at safety? Because, no, he is not playing quarterback, no matter what everyone on allvandals.com wants to say but i feel like zach has been there forever like i feel like he was there for like two or three years while i was there and that seems forever ago um he's a red shirt sophomore so i believe he gray shirted then he's red shirted and i think he had a medical one year zach only played in one game in his idaho career and it was my last game at florida in 2018 so hopefully he's healthy if he's healthy great let's get him on some special teams let's get him on the field athletic dude we'd love to see zach um a name that vandal's and big sky name people are familiar with Darian Nash, a grad transfer from Montana. Um, he will not be with the team this spring. Um, have, I heard he had some personal things, just couldn't be with the team in Moscow. Totally fine, but I hear he is planning on being back in the fall. So if that's the case, hopefully you see Darian Nash in silver and gold um, come come next September. Yeah, there he is, right there from Montana, making some plays. Um, so those are names. 
And then maybe two freshmen we could possibly see in this long list of 16 guys' names I'm rattling off. Um, and some local guys, Colby Noseworthy. He's a freshman from Coeur d'Alene. He was the 5A Inland Empire, so that's the Northern Idaho 5A Football League. Um, he was um, he was their MVP last year. Cole Richardson had that same honor when he played at Lewiston. So Chad Chalich, another name. So we think about the list of guys you get 5A Inland Empire MVP. They usually go on and play college ball. Tanner so Mangum. yeah, Tanner Mangum. Well, that's in Boise, Chris. But I'm talking Northern Idaho. So close. <laughs> I'm talking Gatorade Player of the Year. My yeah. Ball. Well, I'm talking 5A Northern Idaho because we don't get much up here. But anyway, um, he was he was a big contributor for Coeur d'Alene on offense and defense. Um, I'll say on both O and D. So expect to maybe see him at some point. Probably not the spring, but who knows? There seem to be want to try out anyone and everyone right now. Um, and then Terrence um, Antolin, um, a freshman DB out of Ferris High School in Spokane. He was the GSL 2019 defensive MVP. So that's the Spokane lead with G Prep and all those schools. So two of the better players out of Spokane and Coeur d'Alene we nailed down as, for scholarships this year. So maybe names to look forward to in the future. I know I just talked probably forever and I'm sorry, but that's where our DB situation is at. It's not really cut and dry. And the names I named off and beat on the lookout for are names that I were told are doing very well in practice and can be contributors. And I'm really excited. I think, I think Awan Parker is a name I'm probably on the lookout for the most at corner and Vandal fans should be too. Um, Thoughts, questions, what do you guys got? And that was a I th- lot. I think you nailed it. Uh, for people that aren't aware of Ferris, for F- Ferris about the only school in eastern Washington that competes with the western Washington schools. So getting a kid from there is big. But my projected starters on my two deeps basically take Darian Nash out because he was there when Jalen Hoover transferred. He's not playing. Jalen Hoover, boom, swings back in. I think it's going to be all one Parker. You're going to have Tyrese Deadman's probably the only pencil in for sure, dude, him and Hoover. Um, and then I think Ryan Swanson is that that guy who's going to get it because um, I've heard he's absolutely just been a stud. Yeah. And then look at maybe like Tevin Duke coming out of, out of the nickel. But like you said, yeah. it was a weakness for us last year. It's no secret. Wide open, there's a lot of dudes that can prove themselves. I know it's really hard for people to just hear. We don't really know, but – at least it gives you options that we've got people that can play. Maybe somebody will play better in game time. Yeah. And, and even by saying we don't even really know, like this is probably actually the best information you're going to get on who to look out for. Because, I mean, like I'm asking people in the program who, who can tell me what's going on. And this is what they're telling me. That's how open this group is. But also I'm hearing that it's a better group than last year's group in terms of I think we they they think this group's awesome. We have more depth than ever. They expect more out of this group than what we got. You pair our front seven with a group that's even slightly better than average compared to last year. I mean, come on, that's that's a fantastic defense. They just, they just got a guard for like under th- over three seconds, and Chuck will be there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just go <laughs> over three yeah. seconds. And advantageous for us. I mean, downside, we do play the one returning starting quarterback in this league in our first week, but it's going to be advantageous for us that our defensive question mark is going to be an area where everyone except Eastern Washington has a new quarterback. So I guess if there's an area yeah. of instability. That's true. I mean, again, you don't want it, but if you're – No. It could – we might be okay needing some transition time because of how many new quarterbacks we're going to play mm-hmm. who will need transition time on their own anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Chuck Cano played Pac-Man with Eric Berry last year. Exactly. And he will twice this year. So <laughs> that's probably Eric Berry's probably having nightmares right now of having to play. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> oh, that Chuck guy's back. Yeah. Uh, hey, Chuck, special- Chuck's the Chuck's the best Idaho Vandal we've had in probably I don't know, the best name Chuck. Because we had another Chuck who sucked, but anyway, he's gone, so we have the better Chuck right now. Chris, are we going to wrap it up with my favorite position group? Yeah, best for last, baby. Wait, we're yeah, not going to do a Chuck power rankings, Alex, when you bring it up? <laughs> if we did, <laughs> if we did do a Chuck power rankings, I think I know who would not finish first. Anyway, <laughs> best position group we got. People call them the fourth down quarterbacks. I really call the quarterbacks the first, second, and third down punters. We can talk special teams. This is my bread and butter. Um, started off with probably our – have been our best position for like the last 15 years. Punter, Cade Coffey. Um, 
Cade handles the punting and PAT field goal duties for Idaho and will this fall this spring as well. There I am right there. That punt. Look at that guy running down that field. That was his career long punt of 80 yards. And I don't think I down that. I I was was right next to who was that? Oh, it was Roshan right there. But anyway, that was 80 yards. And I remember that. And I'm still pissed at Cade to this day because I was dead ass tired. Look at you running. Hey, look at that. I don't know if I still have it in me. But anyway. Uh, Kate handles the punting and kicking duties, except kickoffs. Kate averaged 43.8 yards last year in punting. Real quick, this is a fun stat. For, I did some good information on this stat. Idaho's punters have averaged at least 43 yards a punt in, their, in, their, in the year, every year except one since 2007. That is insane. That puts in last year, 43 yards average puts you top 10 in the FCS. Yeah. Puts you top thir- top third in the FBS. The one year we didn't, 2016, Austin Rico. That's because every punt he had was from the opponent's 45 because our offense was too good. Um, but, yeah, we've been blessed with punters. Um, Kate averaged a 44.2 career in his in his career. Third best in Idaho history, only behind Rico and Bobby Cowan. So be blessed with the punter we have. Um, last year, touchbacks, he had nine. And you see his inside the 20s was 22 and 23, 50 plus means we have a good coverage team. That's what we want to see. PAT field goals was an area for Idaho last year that is not great. We need to improve on. We left points off the board uh, because of this. Um, he nine to 16, 56%, not great, but three of those were blocks. We have not had, and to be honest with you, our, our PAT field goal protection unit for the past two, three years has not been great. It just hasn't. We had two blocks in this Fresno State. I know I snapped them. I remember that. And I remember going, oh shit, what happened again? Um, so if we get, if we, if Cade makes two, three more kicks, those three go in, his, his percentage goes up to 75%. We don't kick a whole lot. Petrino's never been a, he, outside of Rico's last two years when he should have won the Lou Groza, which is the best kicker in the country, he's never kicked more than like 15 times in a year. Um, Cade's lawn is only 38 last year. Petrino goes for it a lot pay attention to that that's what happens um so solid that's we're solid there logan prescott like i said k doesn't handle kickoffs logan prescott does but this is a really loves this stat logan had 28 kickoffs in 2019 23 of them were touchbacks you know how much you're limiting the opponent to returning the ball that's great you never want to create those big plays um we talked about nick romano earlier but nick romano Hero Sports freshman, All-American, honorable mention as a kick returner, and first team All-Big Skies as a kick returner. 21 returns, 27-yard average per return. That's great. One touchdown. That was Idaho's first kickoff return for a touchdown since 2013. Does anyone know who the team was we returned it against? Uh, again, uh, La Tech. Arkansas no. State. You were close in the neighborhood. Um, at punt returner. Um, Cottrell Haywood ha- handles the punt returns. I'm told Jermaine Jackson is kind of taking some reps there too. But Cottrell, on his 16 attempts at returning the ball last year from punts, 9.1 average. That's awesome. Anytime you can do that, you, you beat a five-yard average. You- that's something you love to see. Basically, every time Cottrell returns the ball, we're getting an extra first down. That helps your offense so much. Um, one thing about special teams, we always were told, it's it's the biggest plays – in the game in terms of no field position. There's no other place in the game where field position is up for so much grabs, like flipping the field to play, having the chance to return a a first down. You don't really get plays like that in in the game. So special teams is massively important. And Idaho has not, we had coach Shoemaker in 2017, coach Purcell in 2018, coach Bresky Jr. Adam Bresky is the special teams coordinator now. So we had three different coordinators, three different years as our first year with the same one back to back. Uh, so hopefully that's good. I can't last but least, I'm going to talk about the snappers, Cam Lang, uh, love Cam. Uh, he handles the short snapping duties, PAT field goals played last six games last year, um, two tackles. And he did some punts as well, but Hogan Hatton uh, plays linebacker primarily, but plays most of the time as a snapper is when he gets on the field. Um, the twin brother of Hayden, he handles the punt duties. So, Idaho special teams, that's it. That's the secondary. That's the Vandals. That's a lot of information we got for you guys. But it's the right information. Everybody, we, it's to the, the fun part and the yeah. usual preview part. But we had Terry. It's been a while. We thought everybody could use a refresher on the positions. 
But it is time. We are going to roll through. I guess it will be a little shorter because we only have six games instead of 12 or 11 to go over. We're going to run through the whole season, hopefully give our hottest takes, and uh, see see where we can get the schedule to go, um, go from here. It's crazy. I was in my head thinking, all right, week one, Southern Utah. Boom. Old schedule. Throw it out the window. We open with the Red Scare rivalry game at home in the Kibbe Dome. You heard it here first from Terry Goblin. 3,100 fans, I believe is what she said. Our normal attendance. Yep. So, uh, and right now, something to consider for everybody out there at home. Only Idaho and Idaho State have announced that they're going to have fans. So we might be one of the only two schools with home field advantage. Southern Utah and Weber State have not announced. Every other Big Sky school has said no. So, let's take advantage of it. Week one. Let's do the order here. Martin. We'll go bottom up. We'll go Boatman, Martin, Brian, Chris, the Hamadon, Dallas Hammer. Boatman. Week one, Eastern Washington, the Kipples and Bits Dome. All right, here's the thing. We're gonna we're gonna good teams win, great teams cover. I know we're gonna be dogs because I know Vegas. We're gonna do both. Um, we're gonna win the game. I, I really think. I think uh, Eastern has had some issues coming out of the gate with trying to get practicing going. They've had weather issues, as we've seen. You know who has had weather issues because we play in the dome. The Vandals. They've lost coaches. I think Eastern might take a while to get going. We're gonna snag this one in the dome. I'm gonna go. We'll win by. A touchdown, at least. At least. Martin? Uh, Idaho, 35-30. Idaho? Yes. Nice. Uh, Brian? I think it's really important for Idaho to snag a win out of their first two games. And I'm not going to pick Eastern to be that win. I think their continuity at quarterback with having no question the preseason offensive player of the year, again, is going to give them an advantage. So I think it'll be close, but I think there's no way Eastern didn't learn the lesson of last year of to quit trying to run it first and second down and give Barry a third and 500 every time, which is what they did. They, they learned that in the second half. So I'm going to go with Eastern. Um, yeah. I think this one's tough. It's going to say a lot about us right off the bat. I mean, right now you're looking at number 22 in the country versus number 12, according to Athlon Sports. Um, and obviously I'm going off whoever rates this higher. That is the tubs at the club standard we set in year one. We will use the ranking system that ranks Idaho the highest. Uh, so we got a top 25 matchup coming off the get. Tricky part here is I don't think Eastern's exactly super stoked about how last year went. I'm going to try to be a realist this year. Usually I go for the optimist role, but I think this season you should be optimistic about anyways. So I'm going to be a little bit more realistic here. The difference is Eastern's lost three coaches in like the last 30, three days. They were just practicing inside a gym. I know that kind of helps because they're playing in a dome, but I don't know, man. I I just think this one's going to be really hard for Eastern, especially if we have 3,100 fans in there. All the Eastern people I've offered to buy tickets for, dumb decision on my part, spite me for it later. I've said, no, they're busy or whatever. So Eastern doesn't even want to show up to this game. Patrick, I'll get you a ticket. I already know you're going to make that comment. You can quit typing. Um, but I just think week one, Kibbe Dome, new quarterback. Yes, it sucks to go against Barrier, but we have two years of film on Barrier. They have zero film on Beaudry, uh, zero film on CJ Jordan, and like seven throws from Nikhil Nair. We're coming They've in as a huge two surprise. Defensive coaches. Yeah, we're a huge surprise on offense, and I don't think Eastern's going to be ready for it week one. They've had a very turbulent offseason between funding, practicing inside, not knowing if they're going to play. Uh, I don't think Eastern is ready for week one. Mm -hmm. Luckily for them, they have his week six, but I'm not going to foreshadow too much. But I'll go surprising, maybe like eight to ten point win for the Vandals week one. I'm going to have to say it's a it's a touchdown victory for Idaho because one thing I've learned across my life as one of the elder statesmen of this podcast is being a Vandal is pain. So they're going to win this first game, and I'm going to immediately think playoffs. Oh, my God, playoffs. And then it's going to fall apart after that at some point because being it a Vandal does. is pain. But As I said after the Eastern win last year, pump the brakes. We don't know anything yet. 
If we beat Eastern in week one, pump the brakes. We don't know anything yet. Week two, UC Davis. Both oh, man. You know, I always thought UC – I kind of had a higher opinion of UC Davis until we did our uh, Big Sky preview show, and Brian kind of talked me out of my UC Davis love, honestly. He really did. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to Brian on this and think UC Davis is not as good as I thought they were. And I think I think Idaho by a touchdown again. I'm going to sound pretty boring here for the first two weeks. Or we're going to completely fall apart. One of the two. We're going to handle it, or we're going to just completely fall apart in shambles. So who knows? Martin? Uh I I think I know I think Idaho's gonna win by and I think I'm gonna say the two scores, probably something like a 35 21, somewhere in that somewhere in that range, probably. Okay. This is a matchup that to me I referenced it earlier. Teams that are in transition at quarterback. And UC Davis, as we talked about, they're in transition just completely on the offense, not only quarterback, offensive coordinator as well. So this is the kind of matchup that, one, I think it's really important. Again, Idaho has to come out the first two weeks, at least one and one. That's how we set ourselves up for the playoffs. I think that defensively we should be too much for UC Davis. So I'm going to pick the Vandals in week two. Uh, UC Davis... Almost got my yearly trap game award. Um, I think coming off high with the win against Eastern, um, it, it's going to be tricky. We didn't play great against them last time. Uh, we, we matched up against them, but I just have more faith in our new quarterback compared to Hunter Rodriguez for them. So I will go Idaho wins this one, but expect it, even though UC Davis is not as good as Eastern, to feel a lot closer and it's to yeah. feel like we barely got out of it. But once again, pump the brakes. We don't know anything yet. I would have to agree with with Brian's take of this team has to go one and one. Uh, I think they're going to go one and one. They're going to lose this game. Cody Hawkins is going to prove that he's a better coach than he was a quarterback. Not that that's very hard. Uh, and I, this is where I, you know, that first week I'm going to be ecstatic over the with the win over Eastern, and then they're going to lose to Davis and. We're going to look like uh, there's maybe a shot if we can win out, but one and one after two games. Which is where we need to be. If we're one and one after two games, everybody, be ecstatic. Uh, Alex, week three at the Northern Arizona Lumberjacks. Idaho by three scores. Don't trust NAU. Trust the Vandies. They just tra- their last game they played was in the walk up Sky Dome. So they are familiar with that travel trip. Vandy's by three touch three touchdowns. Harden, uh, uh, Idaho gets the easy dub. Okay, easy dub. Brian, this is this is the trap game for me. First, we all know the dumpster fire Northern Arizona was at the end of last season, giving up only 558 yards per game, which you know not bad. Only giving up only 43.4 points per game. But I buy that some of that was catastrophic injury issues. Chris Ball has also been a pretty good recruiter, uh, in particular this last class at Northern Arizona. Again, we're going to have an advantage at – we have no idea who their quarterback is going to be. But I expect Idaho is going to win this in a much closer game than any, than a lot of people are going to expect. And if Idaho loses a game we shouldn't this year, it's going to be against Northern Arizona, but I'm not going to pick – I'm not going to pick that right now, so Idaho would be the winner. All right. Uh, Brian, for a second, you had me worried there um, about it possibly being a trap game because I was worried you stole Chris's annual trap game prediction. I am 2-0 and on trap game predictions, by the way, so don't like this. Northern Arizona is a potential trap game. It will be Kate Coffee. He will love it, but hopefully we're not doing much punting because we didn't do much punting last time. Um, I think we kind of talked about it with Eastern. NAU was not exactly thrilled how that game ended last year. It was their first home loss, I believe, of the season as well. Um, And our first away win in the Big Sky Conference since joining the FCS. It's our first road dome game. For those of you keeping track, we've had two at home, one away. And I'll just continue to keep that tracker going throughout this. Expect it to be close. 
I think Idaho does sneak out of it, but Chris Ball has really – NAU is about to be a team that's more than just what Case Cookus was. I think people are going to be very surprised by what NAU is doing. I believe they have the number two recruiting class this past year um, in the entire FCS. Something's building down there. They, they just scheduled a 10-year agreement with Arizona, so their money games are paid for. It's like if we scheduled a 10-year agreement with Wazoo to be their FCS game every year, there's something brewing in that athletic department. I just hope it doesn't come to fruition this spring because I really have high hopes for us. I think we sneak out of this game. And once again, we're starting to figure out what Idaho is here, but I have us a 3-0, and so it's not bad. Yeah, I think Idaho wins it close. Uh, the major bullet points are NAU's replacing Case Cookus. Their defense was almost historically awful last year, uh, so it, it's bound to assume they're not going to be good this year and idaho is not trotting out the dead horse um those three things make it look like hey idaho should win this game by 40 i don't think that's going to happen this is absolutely the trap game this is the game that Mm. if they're one and one or two and oh going into this game it's the mentality has to be we have to punch these guys in the mouth every single play because it it is absolutely the trap game before we move on i'm going to say nau has at Eastern, March 6th, they host us March 13th, and then they have their week off, and then they go to Weber State. So they have a murderer's row of Eastern, Idaho, and Weber State. They'll be cold as hell from the time before playing the Eastern in Cheney. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a – I have a trap game coming up. Not this one, but anyway, I guess I can move us on to our post bye week game, our next game in the Dome, March 27th, our last home game, uh, the Southern Utah – Thunderbirds, um, Idaho, forty-one to seven. That's my that's my score. So we're gonna see CJ CJ Jordan game. That's what I'm gonna call it. Martin, you're on mute. We're talking Southern Utah now, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I I'd, I'd say it's gonna be another. I'd, Say I'd hope for if it's not at least four scores, then I'd be I'm going to be disappointed. I don't win. Southern Utah is they have to me the most fun statistical anomaly of last season, which is they have the number two pass defense in terms of passing yards per game. But uh, as someone who covered the entire Big Sky riding for the Montana Mint, the reason why their pass defense looks okay is because they're getting their asses kicked so bad against every single team in the first half that teams barely had to pass in the second half. I see no reason at this t- point to presume there's some sort of turnaround coming out of uh, Demario Warren at Southern Utah, unless turnaround <clears throat> means they're going to continue their streak of since Southern Utah won the Big Sky a few years ago, they – Three years ago, they have three total conference wins since. I think the real question for Southern Utah is, do do they get win number four in conference in the last three years? It's not coming against Idaho, so Idaho wins. Yeah, uh, last time we played Southern Utah, a better Southern Utah team than this one looks. We won 31-12 in the Kibbe Dome. We are back in the Kibbe Dome now, so for our third and final home dome game, um, I'm actually a little upset at Alex Boatman. Uh, I have it in my notes. This will be a C.J. Jordan game. I think C.J. Jordan plays the majority of this game. I could see us maybe going up 14-17-0 in the first or second quarter. And basically at halftime, or you know, by then we're already taking the gas off, halftime C.J. Jordan just comes out and plays the entire second half. But big win, Vandal W. So I want to preface this with I am a hockey guy first and foremost, so I apologize if none of you are familiar with this term. This game is going to be a shit pumping. This won't be close at all. Yeah, that's hockey's a weird sport, man. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, all right, we're uh, to the battle ICCU Battle of the Domes, aka the hopeful new King Spud Trophy game. <sighs> oh. You guys have been talking and use my as your trap game. This is my trap game. For me, I have Idaho at 4-0, right? We're coming into this game. Idaho State, as we had talked about, has a very tough schedule, but they're not that actually that bad of a team. I think their win total could be deceiving for how bad they actually or how good they are. I think they're better than their record will show. And I think 
I just know how this goes. If we're 4 0, which I have us protected 4 0, for even if we're 3 and 1, and our guys are going, man, we got Easter next week, we got Easter next week, we got Easter next week, we win that, we go to, we go to the playoffs, we win that, we go to the playoffs. That's exactly what's going to happen. Idaho State loves this game. They get up for this game. This has become their rivalry game. I, I was there in 2018. I remember the ass kicking we took. That was their Super Bowl. I don't think Idaho State has ever felt more up for a game in a very long time. And as the only other team that has fans allowed in their stadium that we know of right now, this is my trap game. We're going to have to be really careful going to Pokey, going to Holt Arena, and trying to get out, get out, get out there with a win. I, I, I think they could beat us. I'm going to say we squeak it out, but it's going to be like super close. It's it's going to be tough, and it's not as easy as people think it's going to be. Martin? I I I kind of agree with Alex on this one. It's going to be close. I still be an Idaho win though, but my hope is halftime comes, the lights dim in Holt Arena, whatever that shed is called, and King Spud just falls down from the rafters. Rafters. One can dream, <laughs> Brian. I think Idaho State's schedule is going to be advantageous to us. We saw it last year with Idaho State. They started out pretty strong and absolutely fell apart for about two months, looking a little bit worse each game. Uh, Rob Fennessy thinks Idaho State's a quarterback away. I think they're a defensive unit away from being a team. Second worst scoring defense of the Big Sky last year gave up 39.9 points per game third worst total defense coming up 505 yards per game. And they lost a couple all, all league defensive players. I don't, th- I think the game will be competitive because I think Idaho state and Idaho are getting up for each other, but I am not really concerned about Idaho state at this point. So I'm going Idaho. Yeah. I uh, actually think this game is not going to be very close. I think Idaho state has basically graduated the team that made them decently relevant the past couple of years. Both Gellers are gone. Michael Dean is gone. Uh, Graves at linebacker is gone. They have so many question marks. That's sadly a new transfer quarterback from Wyoming and Vanderwall is not one of those question marks. Um, the pro- the question mark is every other piece around them. I have this as a Nikhil Nair game. I think this is one where Nikhil Nair will get a bunch of snaps. And I think the Vandals win this one pretty handedly. And I plan to be in pokey and watch it. Oh, Have also, ever- that's that's dome game number five for everybody Ro- paying attention. Road dome, right? Road dome game? Yep. Second road good that's, dome game. Last that's dome five game in of the a season. Row. Five, five in a row, right? Ooh, yep. You're getting to my point, baby. Hold, Chris, don't, I think don't you need to ahead. make the, uh, the Nair – t-shirt fan club uh i don't know if you'd be the only fan but you'd certainly be number one and we need to get you that shirt <laughs> he's not he's uh, not a nayer sayer at least you know Ooh, i like that <laughs> and the shirt uh, just branded itself <laughs> i don't have anything else to add uh i i i know gonna win um uh, i do think it's gonna be somewhat close it's not gonna be a down to the wire field goal in the final seconds close but i do think like boatman was saying this is going to start becoming a rivalry. And, you know, there's that old cliche, throw the records out when these two rivals play. This isn't a protected rivalry in the big sky, but I do think that he's right. The players kind of get up for this one a little bit more. Uh, and it's it's going to be one that Idaho State, if they come in and they haven't won a single game, they're going to be nothing to play that for. More motivated. They're going to be dangerous. That's what I'm scared of is they're a team that just is like, screw it. We have nothing to lose. But and ruin Idaho's- your season. And Idaho's looking at Eastern next the week after. That's why I have this as my trap game. And speaking of Eastern Washington. Speaking of Eastern Washington. We get to play outside, Chris. Aren't you happy? Finally. Finally. No fans. And, I mean, a tiny stadium anyway. But I wonder I, – I, I remember when we played Eastern. We, played, we drove up there the morning of at like 7 a.m. We left Moscow. It was it was actually a really nice day, but anyway, we're gonna lose this game. This is this is our loss. Um, I, I think Chris and I are literally on the exact same boat here. Um, I think we're gonna get up for Eastern. I think the reasons we beat Eastern Week One are the reasons 
are, where Eastern will correct. I think Eastern is a wounded animal right out of the gate. I think they've had some issues. They haven't had a lot. Like I said, they haven't practiced together a lot. They've lost three coaches. Um, what the hell's going on up there? Now they get to fix that throughout the whole year. We get to face them last game of the year. They might be undefeated until this point as well, or have unde- lost one game. So that happens. They know they need to win to go to the playoffs. We know we need to win to like definitely go to the playoffs. But I think this team, we might be playing not to lose rather than to win. Eastern Eastern snags it by 10. Martin? I, as much as I want to not, as much as I'm like, I feel like I'm for it. I'm, like, I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking they need, I, I want to pick them to lose, but Mr. Sunshine and Rainbow's here. Just, I, I, I think they're going to go, I think they're going to win. And Mike Beaudry is going to lead them on a game winning drive at the end of the game. Before I give my pick, I want to know if the word loss is in Martin's vocabulary. I don't believe so. Yeah, I believe. What is Martin's nope. all time record on this show? Are you picking us, what, 10 and 1? I think. I think you picked us was the, 10 and went- 2. So you've picked us 20 and 3 in the past two seasons. Yep. All right. Yep. Hopefully one of these days, you're right. (laughs) We're going to hope there's no thematic connection between previous Martin picks and this season. So fingers crossed. But I'm going to – I am going to make a pick, mostly because I really want to pick Idaho finishing 4-2. and I say we lose to Eastern. I I do really um, think this is great for the the Idaho-Eastern rivalry for us to play twice like this. I think if – you know, just like Bowman talked about for Idaho, Idaho State, there's real fire in there because of what's happened those first two years. I think us playing Eastern twice could add fire as well uh, to how the players understand the rivalry and also fans too. But I am a I'm buying heavily in Eric Berrier stock. I'm going to keep doing that. I don't have that much. I don't have the kind of faith in Aaron Best that maybe Kyler Neal does. Shots fired, but. I, I think Eastern's going to have momentum heading into the end of the season. And yeah. though Eastern did not make the playoffs last year, they closed well last year. They closed real well, of course, the year they made it to the championship. So picking Eastern as a team that has been there and won games that mattered at the end of the Big Sky season. And Idaho just hasn't done it yet. So until I see us do it, I'm not going to pick us to do it. Yeah, I, I'm on the record of this um, for a while now that I thought this series was going to be split. You beat them in the Kibbe Dome. It's, it's just – it's going to be a whole – that'll be two straight. It just stinks that we – I mean, we're supposed to be in Cheney, so we should take it as a blessing that we actually get a home and home. We kind of get back-to-back home games against them to really help build it. Uh, you're looking at the benefit here. It's our first game outside, ladies and gentlemen, uh, which also means it will be only the second game we've played all year with no fans, um, which is another whole different woohoo for Idaho and being able to watch it on TV and feel like it's a football game. Average temperature in Cheney, Washington in February is 39 degrees is the high, 24 is the low. March, 48 is the high, 29 is the low. April, and we're talking April 10, baby. 57 degrees is the high. You might have to bring out a little bit of sunscreen in Cheney. We dodged the bad Cheney weather. We're not Montana here. This is going to be a fun game to go to. Just the result is probably not going to be that fun. And, well, we can't go to it, so that's a terrible thing. Um, So in a long-winded way, I guess what I'm trying to say is, though I am very optimistic on the season, I'm trying to be a realist. 6-0, Six and zero, baby. Mark it down. We stomp the Eagles in Cheney. Not even close. Two gloves. Barrier has zero fire. Their season is over because they are three and two at this point. They go three and three and miss the playoffs. Two gloves. Barrier ain't got nothing on Mike Baudre. I am going to go the exact opposite and say this is a double-digit loss that doesn't feel close at all from start to finish, and the final score does not indicate how bad of a game it was, completely devastating the entire Idaho fandom that hoped that this would be the year we'd make the playoffs. 
Uh, which is a whole other side question here, real quick. For those of you that picked the lost here, that's we got one five and one and two four and twos. With the MEAC opting out, there's officially another at large bid. Are you saying the Big Sky Conference does not receive two at larges? Third place in the Big Sky, not getting a playoff bid, huh? You think it's going to go three to CAA, three to the Missouri Valley, and the Big Sky should skin two? I don't if think I four. Don't I don't think four and two takes us out. I, I think four, four and two here. takes us out. Four and two. To, what about five and one? Five and one, you're in. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I would say that getting crushed in the final game, like I think is going to happen, that will say four and two, you're out. It's it's going to come down to the optics of you got crushed by Eastern by 17 points. Yeah. The, the thing to me that matters is because we only have the six six games, which does put us at a disadvantage, disadvantage to, compared to other conferences, Idaho absolutely has to go five and one. And the reason I say that isn't just the five wins. It's that if we don't go five and one, we probably don't have a quality win, which means we're at four wins without any great wins. So if we go five and one, we have a chance. But at, based off my projections, I'm saying we burn Eastern other big sky playoff teams. Idaho's on the outside looking in. Yeah, I, I guess with the BX sitting out. Yeah, who knows? I mean, I guess the, my my question is is what is a six and two like? What does a six and two um, Missouri Valley team look like compared to a, maybe even a, even like a second five and one Big Sky team? That's the like. Yeah, the Missouri Valley uh, will be stacked. They've got like five teams that are serious playoff teams have, this year. The Big Sky does not have. That I rank, they have three teams. I think I ranked in the top five. You know what I mean? In terms in our FCS Fan Nations poll, in terms of where how I value Northern Iowa and South Dakota State, I value Northern Iowa pretty high. We find out this Friday night on ESPN Plus. Get your subscriptions today, folks. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't see how the Missouri Valley going in, into this year isn't going to be a three bid league with yeah. the condensed playoffs. So I think they're already going to be at three. It's whether or not the Big Sky gets three, the CAA gets three. Or somehow one of those other random schools, like a like a Monmouth, wins all but one game, and they're already ranked in the top twenty five in some polls, and they get some credit. So anyway, I just want to say when we're all sitting here at six and zero talking about our first playoff game, you guys can go to the club and buy me my tub tokens and Martin. I'm calling. It, I'm dead serious this year, man. This is even hyping the team. I don't get why you guys have so much faith in Eastern. To be honest with you, <laughs> if I mean, we yeah, go six and zero, Eric Berry is so great, uh, but he didn't really look great last year, did he? If we go six and zero, I'm buying both of you multiple tubs. <laughs> yeah. And as I see Brian rapidly typing away to pull up Eric Berry's stats, I'm referring to the Idaho matchup. <laughs> well, Berry looked absolutely good in the second half against Idaho. It's Aaron Best is a moron and tried to run it against us on first and second down every time. What's that his, was their issue. What's his? Uh, what's the Twitter handle on that? Aaron Aaron Worst. Aaron Worst. Aaron Worst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, that's man. yeah. I mean, look, Bar- Barrier, no quite like Chris Barrier had like what one rough game last year. Any any team in the Big Sky other than Sac State or maybe Montana would have loved to have him, including us. So I guess the the question I'd throw back to you guys too is I I am optimistic about Idaho. I say four and two puts that's us out of good fringe, season. Four and two puts us at a fringe playoff team, and a fringe playoff season is not a bad season whatsoever. I'm just going to throw back to you in the same question you said about not having faith in Aaron Best. What about the past three years in Idaho lets you makes you think, oh, yeah, Paul's going to put it together in a way that's going to put us to the top of the conference? Because every year Paul's had a consistent starter at quarterback. We've been absolutely some of our best teams offensively, 2017 and 2016, before oh. Matt Linehan was hurt. Oh. And then he dealt with injuries with an illegal hit from New Mexico State. Uh, that took him out of the 2015 season or 2014 season. So we've had consistent, a quarterback that can sit back there that has an arm. Absolutely. Petrino has showed me that it can work. The problem is he hasn't had that best of luck at the quarterback position. Now you can call it luck, but I, I'm I just see Mark in the <laughs> still fingers crossed that we can make the jump. I'm not going to call the last two years bad luck, but I mean, this is we've said it's a big year for Aaron Best on multiple shows. It's a big year for Paul too. Paul's got a ton of talent yeah. coming back. If 
if he's going to show that he has what it takes to, to, have, to take Idaho towards the playoffs, I, I think this is a year he's got to do it. Yeah. yeah. For those of you live in the chat section, Dallas just – uh, admitted to the owner of the corner club that he's never been in the corner club. So with that, I think it's time we try to wrap this one up before Dallas, you get some hate mail sent to you. Uh, hmm. <laughs> that, that was around the bar brought to you by Hughes river expeditions, needing summer vacation plans that even COVID-19 can't ruin. There's an option right eye in your back door. Venture into the largest protected wilderness in the continental United States for the ultimate form of social distancing. Hughes River Expeditions has run first-class trips on the rivers in the West since 1976. Enjoy a multi-day trip down the Middle Fork of the Salmon, the Salmon River Canyons, and the Selway, or even a special trip like the one to see the Perth Side Meteor Shower. Camp on pristine beaches. <laughs> Hike amazing trails, spot elusive wildlife, soaking beautiful natural hot springs, take in history all along the river's edge, and let Hugh HRE handle everything else. Hughes River Expedition is vandal-owned and operated and ready to take you on the vacation of a lifetime. Booking now through the 2023 season. Don't miss out and check them out at HughesRiver.com. Give them a call, 800-262-1882. What are you waiting for? Find out what it's like to grab a paddle, catch dinner, and ride the ball all throughout the Gem State. Call them now at 800-262-1882 or visit them at HughesRiver.com. Brian Marceau's favorite thing about Hughes River Expeditions is camping on pristine beaches. Absolutely his favorite thing. Yeah, the thing I thought they did, I don't think it's legal. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's highly illegal. Maybe not Montana. They do do some trips in Montana, but I think it's still illegal. Uh, anyways, if those of you that don't know, it's a great plug that Dallas and Brian will be continuing to do our basketball podcast. If you don't understand this inside joke, go listen to the basketball podcast. Uh, Martin will also be going on shortly after them or before them if they get busy just chatting about you know the team. And uh, Martin will come on early, breaking down the women's too. Which brings us uh, awesome news. You can see Mark is in the uh, comments. We are going to be doing football live shows after the games like we do for basketball. And number one will be coming to you live from the Corner Club in Moscow, Idaho, because all of us but Brian attend, plan on attending. So he can at least run the show you know, with a real computer and everything like that. But, yeah, so uh, it should be fun. We're excited to bring you guys that stuff. Next week, dude, yeah. we're back. I can't believe it. Oh, and Dallas is just uninvited. <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course it's you and me. It's just Sorry, you and Dallas. me and Martin. Yeah. That's Sorry, all right. Dallas, Dallas, we'll have a tub for you. You can we'll order a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, thank you for tuning in. Next week we have Eastern Washington. If we cannot get like Kyler Neal or Rusty Kramer. Maybe we'll get Patrick on. He's been a good fan, and we've done pretty good with listeners and Brian and Dallas joining the show. Um, but that's it. We'll we'll see you guys next week on Tuesday in the Basketball Podcast. We'll see you guys Saturday. Um, now it's time for the best band in all the land, the Sound of Idaho. Play us out. Next Go Saturday. Go Vandals. Go Vandals. Go Vandals.